Hello everybody, welcome back for another tech tip here at 45 Drives and um, today we're talking about something that we've hinted in other videos we've talked about before but we've never really talked about them exactly. We're talking about the new Mosaic 3 M SATA drives out of Seagate. These are the hammer drives, the heat assisted magnetic recording hard drives. These are a 30 terabyte drive and honestly they are the future of traditional magnetic recording. Anyway, we're going to break these down, tell you why they're so great, what they are. So, why don't you join me? Alright, so I got a lot of fun things to talk about these hammer drives today, but let's start with the big top level what. What is hammer? Heat assisted magnetic recording. So, fundamentally they still work as a hard drive always has. There's platters spinning, there's arms of writing. But what's different? What's new about these? Why is, are these such a big deal? Why can we achieve higher capacity than we ever could before? Well, the problem with making things more dense is you have to make things smaller on the platter. You make things smaller, the bits that write to um, the platters need to get smaller too. They hit a bit of a limit. They couldn't go any smaller while keeping everything stable. So how does Hammer solve this? Well, Hammer uses tiny, 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 precisely controlled laser. It heats the um, part of the platter that it wants to write to. It heats it up to make it easier to magnetize so the head can pass over, lock in its data, it immediately cools it, and boom, it's in place. So a little bit of a deeper dive into how that works. So the platter is coated with a specially high coercive material that's very stable at normal temperatures. So it essentially kind of locks everything in. A rough analogy of what's going on there is kind of think about uh, maybe you need to paint a piece of board or something like that and you've got a tiny little sliver that you want to paint red but everything else is, I don't know, green. Um, and, but the paintbrush you have is too wide to um, paint that little sliver you want. So think of it as you kind of like mask everything else, paint over it then rip the masking off. Rough analogy because it's not exactly what's going on but you see what my point is there. They just, they just expose just enough of the platter by changing its, mag, its um, magnetic properties so it can, the head can pass over, not affect anything else, and only change the part it wants. With all that said, that means Seagate's figured out a way to make the platters much more dense, meaning we can pack more dense, more platter, more dense platters in a single three and a half inch hard drive, and we can get crazy capacities like 30 terabytes into one. So, like I said, Seagate. Seagate are the pioneers of the hammer technology. They believed in this years ago, and they've now seen it come to fruition. These are commercially shipping. Uh, if you want to learn more, Seagate's got tons of good information. I recommend you go check out that. If you want to see more 45 Drive style stuff on that, we had a friend of ours, Alan Nagel, join us on our What's Been In podcast. He was a long-term engineer at Seagate, now working at a company called HD Store. That's where we get our hard drives from. Um, and he talked at length about hammer drives and everything. Alan is a wealth of knowledge and I recommend anyone to go check that out. Now with all this said, anyone who's been in this industry long enough has probably, particularly in the professional storage game, has run into the uh, SMR, the shingled magnetic recording disaster debacle, if you will, of when all those drives hit the market. And that was the big push of like, here are much denser drives, yay, everything's saved. But Due to the way that the, the shingles, the, the platters were physically laid out, they were ridiculously slow, particularly when it came to using them in RAID arrays and stuff like that. And um, it soured a lot of people's opinions on new hard drive technology. So if you're looking at these hammer drives thinking, I don't know, are we got another SMR issue on our hands? Like this all sounds too good to be true. Um, it is true. They're, they're friggin' amazing. And I say it like that because I was that person side-eyeing. They gotta use more power, there's no way, mm, I don't know. Um, but they're awesome. It's impressive that Seagate has been able to um, invest this time, dedication into this technology and then actually bring it to market. So what I'm gonna do for the rest of this video is we're gonna talk about power, we're gonna talk about performance, we're gonna talk about all the things that you might go, what's different, how are they different than the traditional CMR, co conventional magnetic recording drives. If you don't believe in Hammer, you should. They're pretty awesome. There may be no way to make you trust me, but we need to go. So 
the rest of the video, I'm gonna go over some of the more technical details, weight, power, this, and I'm gonna nerd out a little bit here. So if you got all the information you wanted about these really cool, high capacity drives, you're welcome to leave now if you want. Um, and if you do, be sure to reach out to us at 45 Drives because we can outfit you with a really dense server with some really dense drives. We've got a good relationship with Seagate, our friends at HD Store. He's a friend from work. And we've got stock ready for these to go. So reach out to us. Anyway, with that said, let's talk about power, performance, weight, the details. Okay. All right, so the first one we'll talk about is an easy one. Do they weigh more? Yes, but not a whole lot. They're only 15 grams more than a comparable 20 terabyte or the previous generation non-hammer drives. That's an extra 0.9 of a kilogram um, for uh, our XL60 units, which is negligible. No big deal, right? So, yeah. Makes sense though. There's not massive components they put in there, but there is more. So they weigh a little more. Okay, the next one's performance. This is the big one. This is what screwed the SMRs, right? Like, oh, big capacity, but the IO performance was horrible. The write performance was horrible because it had to rewrite everything to do anything. So this one, you go the same thing. Okay, you're not shingled, but you have to blast something with a laser before you can write to it. That's gotta add some latency. No, it doesn't. There, according to the data sheets, um, the, 20 terabyte versions of these uh, are about 285 megabytes a second sustained throughput. Um, the 30s on the data sheet are 275 megabytes uh, per second throughput. Um, and then we've lowered them up with file. Just check those numbers out. Accurate. Saw the same things. And then when we got down into random IO performance, negligible. They perform the exact same. So again, no big change there, which is a huge positive. All right, so comparing from the new hammer drives to the more conventional ones, weight, check, pretty negligible. Uh, pe performance, pretty much the exact same, negligible. Both good things. We don't want them to change. We want them to feel the exact same as the old way. Uh, so it comes down to power. Do they use more power? My gut feeling the whole time when I was talking to Alan and Seagate, our friend Mr. Nagel there, was like, they've got to use more power. They have to. And they're like, no, no, they don't. They, the engineers are saying they don't. And then, of course, skeptical side eye. All right, we'll see. Um, but no, they don't use any more power. If they do, it's negligible. Like I'm talking under a watt, but there's more than just saying a number here. Cause I could read the data sheet. I could tell you what the number was, which was accurate, but power tells you a lot more of what's going on in the hard drive. And, um, I just find that really interesting. So too bad for all of you. You're going to find it interesting too. Cause I'm going to break it down for you. When you're talking about the power usage of a hard drive, it's important to look at mm, the two voltage levels that it uses to operate. It operates with a 12 volt and it operates with a five volt. The 12 volt controls the motor, allows it to spin, keeps that spinning, everything like that. The five volt controls the logic, the arm, everything else. Okay, so let's talk about the 12 volt first. So we'll start with the 12 volt. The 12 volt is what controls the motor, like I said. Um, the thing you have to be kind of concerned about here is the initial startup. The spinning up of an electrical motor from a dead stop creates something called an inrush current and it, it eats a lot of current. So what we did with all these drives is we went and we hooked it up to our oscilloscope and our measurement tools and we measured what these things were. The peak startup current per drive was 1.7 amps per drive. That gives us 21 watts for a brief small sub second as the thing spins up. Now, that could be an issue. 21 watts per drive, you put 60 of these in there, that's a lot of power. But that's the nice thing about staggered spin up. Uh, are the HBA controller that starts the drives, start them staggered over time so that surge doesn't overblow everything. But once those drives are spinning and they're running at idle, the current pulled by that 12 volt line is only about 4.5 amps, so about 5.4 watts. And then that's at idle. And then that does not change even under load. So at this point with the 12, what you can imagine is there's a little bit of a startup surge. She settles back down and then it just stays there for the life of the hard drive. And that behavior makes sense. Cause once that motor spin and once that disc is at 7,200 RPMs, it doesn't need to slow down or spin up or whatever. So it just stays. It makes sense that under load and idle, same current draw. Anyway, so that's the 12. It's actually pretty simple. What gets a little more interesting is the five volt line. 
four phases I'll talk about. It's the initial like boot up of like what we're seeing, what fluctuation we're seeing, and then we'll talk about which uh, right I/O pattern pulls the most power. Random writes, random reads, blah blah blah. So, but let's just talk about the boot up first. So, like on that initial startup of this server, the initial pull of power out of these drives is just it's a single watt, single watt per drive on the five. So nothing crazy there, right? And then as we get into the BIOS screen and the initialization of all the PCI devices and everything, that's when the HBA cards start to boot the drives up. Because remember, I mentioned with the 12, we're, all, we're staggering these drives. So this is, you can see the activity of the HBA cards telling the drives to wake up. It's really, really cool. So we see a fluctuation there from anywhere from 1.7 watts to 2.7 watts per drives, um, per drive. So what's going on is the every few seconds, the HBA card is saying, all right, wake up, wake up. It does its wake up, another one. So when you watch the track, it kind of bumps up and down like this. Um, when I say track, I mean the, the trace is the word I should have used. Really cool. And then so it'll do that progression for a little bit. And then when you're, if you're watching the screen, the Linux screen, it's just sitting there kind of like doing its loading, waiting for initialization of everything like that. And then boom, you'll hit the login screen. And then the drive settle down to a good cool 1.6 watts idle. So now we're ready to go. At this point, your server's sitting there idle. What are we seeing per drive? We're seeing about 5.4 on the 12. We're seeing about 1.6 on the 5. So you add those together, you get about, what, 7 watts of drive? So 7 watts of drive idle on the 30 terabytes. Pretty darn good. But we know that the new changes come in when we write. So let's take a look at the I.O. performance or the, the, the power draw as we write to these things. So we're only going to look at the 5 volt line because remember what I said, the 12 does not change under the load. We don't care anymore. It's just a steady 5.4 watts. So let's look at this. We're comparing it to a 20 terabyte drive, a 20 terabyte Seagate Exos drive. That's our kind of like baseline of like how much more or less power are these doing. My hypothesis going into this was writes should be more. That's when you're using the laser to do stuff. We should use more power on writes. And that is what we saw. So if we look at our random read load, we get about 2.5 watts on the drive on the 5 volt side. So a total 7.6 watts uh, on the random read. Funny enough, not funny enough, but that's the exact same number I got out of the um, 20 terabyte drive when I did it there. Sequential reads um, were higher than the random reads. We had a total of 3.38 watts on the 5 volt line, added up 8.7 watts total. So Sequential reads use more power than random reads, um, but again, completely in line with the 20 terabyte drive that I compared it to. Okay, the, but so now on the random write side of things, we get about 2.59 watts on the 5 volt line for a total of 8 watts per drive while we're doing random writes. This now is a 15% increase over the 20 terabytes. So as our hypothesis, we were it appears that we were right that the writes are more. However, 15% more per drive is not crazy. I was expecting way more double honest at first, but I, I was being cynical. Um, but when we look at the sequential writes, this is the maximum load, is when you're sequentially writing to these drives, which again would make sense because you're consistently having it to, to, to fire up, change the coercivity of the material so it can write. And this we were seeing about 4.33 watts per hard drive on the right which gave us a total of 9.72 watts per drive during sequential writes. So this kind of broke from my hypothesis a little bit because actually it wasn't really any higher than the other one. And I'd say like a rounding error kind of, it, it, it was completely negligible. Anyway, interesting. The good news about all those numbers there, because I did just yell a bunch of numbers at you, it's all below, we like to use 10 watts of drive as kind of our like, um, uh, benchmark of like how much power a hard drive is going to use, an enterprise hard drive is going to use. And uh, the I was anticipating that these were going to make us change our benchmark of what an enterprise drive will pull. But no, still fit within the range. So really impressive stuff that Seagate was able to do great engineering to figure that out. Okay, so that's kind of the overview on like the hardware. Again, impressive, impressive pieces of technology. Hard drives are in general, hammer drives even more so. One more plug to Seagate believe in it in a technology that they started 30, if not longer years ago, see it come to fruition, great work, um, great for everyone. Now, but let's talk about using them, using them in software defined solutions, using them in hardware raid cards. What are implications? Like, 
can I use them in a Ceph cluster or a ZFS array? Long story short, yes, you can use these in a ZFS array, a Ceph array. Like I said, it's not single magnetic recording. All, all the power usage, performance, everything that we'd expect about these drives, the only difference is they're bigger. So, yeah, you can throw them in a ZFS array. Yeah, you can put them in a Ceph cluster. But the only difference is they're bigger. So what is the part that's gonna change? What is the part we really care about if drives keep getting bigger? Rebuild times, recovery times. The only, only true downside to something like this is the kind of a lot of eggs in one basket, right? So if this is in a ZFS array and say you're doing a Z1, only one parity, and this drive fails, that's 30 terabytes of data that you have to regenerate to the new one. There's nothing fundamentally wrong with that. It's just gonna take longer than a smaller capacity drive. And that's fine, as long as you're aware of that kind of limitation. The opinions on how big your drive should be will always vary. But we're a believer that there's nothing wrong with massively sized drives, as long as you plan accordingly. Do larger parity. Do it, make sure you do a two. Make sure you do a two parity drive so you have time to recover. We did, we also did the work to measure the rebuild times of it, and it's linear. Like, there is no exponential growth of like, oh, now we're 30 in hammer drives. It actually takes four times as long as it would have for a comparable drive right next to it. It's, it's, it increases linear, so all you need to remember is balance your drive protection, your number of parity, to how long it's gonna take to rebuild everything. So just keep that in mind. The same thing is true with a Ceph cluster, but it's a little better in a Ceph cluster because you have way more parallel access to rebuild it and you've got more copies. Like I said, Ceph is probably the safest thing in the world. But anyway, I do have to say one more thing too. Hardware RAID. We are big believers of software RAID. We are in software-defined storage. think it's the best. But hardware RAID still exists. It's still needed in some areas. So what about using these with hardware RAIDs? Well, they do take a little longer to spin up and be ready due to the initialization of the laser and the calibration of that. So with software RAID, no big deal because the services and everything don't get cracking until it's already into the operating system. The drives are sitting there. Hardware RAID cards are different. They might time out thinking the drive's not responding. So there is some uh, widening of kind of idle time that you need to be aware of with certain hardware RAID cards. So that's the only thing to keep in mind there. Let's end on one kind of crazy idea. Um, 30 terabytes, incredibly dense. I remember years and years and years ago being excited about six terabyte drives. 30 terabytes. We have an XL60 server. That means you can have 1.8 petabytes of storage in a single 4U chassis. That's nuts. And they're not done. They're going denser from here. So if you want to talk to us here at 45 Drives about getting a very dense Storinator, whether it's a big one, little one, but you want to use 30 terabyte Seagate drives, give us a call. We'd love to talk to you about it. We've got a great relationship with Seagate. We've got stock ready. These are commercially shipping now, and we're ready. It's terribly well balanced. Well, if there's too much weight, you lose power on the swings.